Well, um, as you just heard, I'm a senior student of philosophy at Fort Hayes. I've been studying philosophy for the past four years and biology for the past three. Um, well, and, and, and um, I guess a lot of the terms that I use are going to be technical terms, and they might be unfamiliar to you, whether they're about philosophy or about biology. So I did hand out the glossary. So if you ever find yourself confused about how I'm using a term, that's how I'm using it. <clears throat> OK. So uh, there's a real similarity between what's happening in linguistic communication and what's happening in the genetic inheritance system. First off, both of their functions are information transfer. For um, example, in linguistic communication, say a professor wants a meeting with me. Well, uh, he writes something on a piece of paper with a pen, makes some marks with ink on a piece of paper, puts it in my box, and two days later I show up at his office. Remarkable, right? <laughs> Uh, similarly, in the genetic inheritance system, uh, in animals, <coughs> you get a reproductive, you have a reproductive event, it's probably sex, um, then all the, all the genes copy themselves, DNA that happens in the cell and in the zygote development occurs, and nine months later you've got a sweet baby. <laughs> and that's also pretty remarkable. So there's a real similarity in the process, and there's information that's being transferred from um, one system, a mind, or a reproductive event, <coughs> parents, and it, and it uh, manifests in a certain sort of way, a message, and, and there's communication occurring. So there's um, the details of the genetic, genetic process are just like the details of the communication process, and, um, <coughs> and this is an analogy. So the function of an analogy is uh, to compare a familiar system with something that's unfamiliar to provide clarity to the unfamiliar system. So we know a lot about symbolic uh, linguistic communication and maybe something about that will clarify something about what's happening in genetic inheritance. So the question is how similarly or how seriously should we take the analogy? Is it more than a metaphor? Is it literal? Um, are the messages, are there messages being sent through genetic inheritance, just like there are through language. Um, and there's a significant difference. It's the presence of a mind. So what happens here in the thought is it's a mental process. And what happens through the reproductive event, there's no mind present at all. And the question is, does this make a difference um, to the actual message being sent? Is there, is there still semantic content? So in every way that genes resemble something that we know is intentional. <clears throat> Maybe this shows that a mind isn't present or isn't necessary for semantics. That there's everything relevant without the present of a mind. <clears throat> so the, this is the real question I'm trying to answer with the, whole, with the whole project is at what level of organization does meaning fit into the natural world? Because we know it happens in our minds and um, maybe it happens in such a similar process that's happening in our genes. So to, in, intentionality is traditionally defined as aboutness. For example, if you have a thought, it's definitely about something. I'm thinking about peanut butter. Well, uh, there's, a, there's a specific content to that thought, and there's specific meaning to written language. You know, so if you um, write a sentence, it has real meaning and it's carrying a message relative to your thought. And we call this semantics, the actual meaning um, not just the simple structure of the language. And that's real intentionality. Another way people talk about intentionality is as if. It's talking about a non-intentional system as if it has real intentionality, and this is just metaphor. Uh, some examples might clarify. Consider the statement, I'm thirsty, really thirsty, because I haven't had anything to drink all day. This is different from, my lawn is thirsty, really thirsty because it hasn't been watered in a week. Now, there's some conscious experience happening in, in me that's definitely not happening in my lawn. We're just talking about the lawn as if it has intentionality 
Whereas we're talking about me because I do have intentionality. Now this is a little temptation in biology uh, because it's actually animals that we traditionally think to have intentionality, people like you or me. And it's really easy to talk about genes like they have intentionality too. Consider this example. I'm not going to read it all to you, but you see the bold-faced words uh, are, are words that we typically use to talk about really intentional systems. Uh, the base sequences can be recognized by enzymes. They discriminate. There's an editing process correcting mistakes, proofreading mechanisms, desired gene products. These are all uh, words we would use to talk about minds. So, uh, either biologists, and this, this language is really, really common in biology classrooms. You talk about transcription, translation, proof leading, <clears throat> all of these things. Uh, are common up to the highest levels of biology we use to describe genetic processes. And the question is, are, would we actually mean that these uh, systems have intentionality, or are we talking about them as if they have int intentionality? So there's this author, Nicholas Shea. He says that even though DNA isn't produced by a mind, it still has real meaning. Genes still mean something, and there's real intentionality in the genome. Now, Nicholas Shea sounds a lot like, well, I was having a conversation with someone about this, and they said, Nicholas Shea, so just for clarity's sake, and to add a little color <laughs> on the screen, we're talking about this guy, <laughs> faculty of philosophy at Oxford University, not, you know, divorce, you know, Jessica Simpson guy. Pretty, though. <laughs> okay, so this is what Shea has to say. This is how he construes intentionality in the genome. He says, uh, heredity is the natural function of DNA. By this, he means that in general, DNA exists to transfer information between generations. Um, this is unlike the particular, any particular instance of DNA that we might encounter. Its purpose is to develop a particular set of characters. Um, it's sort of a set of instructions for which the developmental system to act upon and produce those characters. In general, uh, DNA exists as an information transfer <coughs> system. And, and, and that happens through inheritance. Through a reproductive event, uh, a set of characters is passed on to the next generation. And the genes themselves, actual DNA, uh, is a token. It's a semantic token, or well, we'll talk about that in a minute, but it's, a, it, it's actually the messenger. Fitness is the ability to, or it's the, um, uh, it's the, it's, I didn't write it down and I forgot my definition. Does anyone have a handout? What, what did I say it was? <coughs> Thanks. Fitness is the, uh, is a relative measure of the ability to survive and reproduce among the alternative genotypes and phenotypes. So it's um, how well a, an organism or a genotype or a phenotype actually copies itself and um, will survive long enough to copy itself and then actually does copy itself. And anytime there's a reproductive event, it's success. Successful because it's um, performing the natural function of DNA, which is inheritance. So, uh, any, any developmental outcomes determine fitness. So, a uh, gene um, has immediate products like amino acids, and those fold into proteins. And there's this whole causal sequence of events that um, eventually turns into an organism like you or I. We have a lot of characteristics, and um, they determine our ability, well, they affect our ability to survive and also to reproduce. So, um, although we think about like, something obvious like how well my reproductive organs function or how attractive I am to other members of the species. Those are obvious examples of fitness boosters, but something um, further back in the developmental causal chain could have a big impact too. Like if certain, um, oh, certain enzymes aren't being produced, it can all have an effect on your ability to survive or an organism's ability to survive and reproduce. 
So any of these developmental outcomes affect fitness. And you understand that since it's genes um, causing these outcomes, that uh, it's because of their outcomes, a gene carrying instructions to develop those outcomes are retained in the lineage, that they're copied and reproduced. So there's this relationship between the outcomes of genes and um, their the fitness. So any genes that exist today were retained for the role they produced and for the role they played in producing certain outcomes in an organism's ancestors. So uh, they were retained not because of the role they're playing in your uh, development today and your function, but actually for the role that they played in your mom and your dad and their parents and all through evolutionary history. <coughs> when an individual successfully reproduces, it means that something went right. <clears throat> so it's retained and it's reproduced. Um, any character, any genetically controlled character that increases fitness is more likely to be retained in the lineage, of course, than one that decreases fitness or is neutral to fitness. Because, <clears throat> well, the definition of fitness is reproduction, survival, and reproduction. So, Any genotype that exists today well, this is, this is actually the crucial move in Shay's argument. Any genotype that exists today are semantic tokens carrying content about what they were retained for. So he says that um, any piece of G DNA that's existing today is carrying a message about uh, how successful it was in, in one's ancestors. <clears throat> so it was historically successful in the lineage and um, I guess I was going to say something about function. Um, function is what something actually does. And so any function that a gene performed historically is uh, represented or is, uh, is part of the message that's carried today. DNA's metafunction is heritability. Um, by this, Shea is referring to the general function of DNA as an inheritance, uh, as a method of inheritance. And he just means that um, genes today say something about the past. They're carrying content. So, uh, the, symbols, um, the symbols that DNA produces are actual DNA molecules, genes. The content is the historic su success and the function is to develop a mechanism that will copy the genes. And this is an organism. So uh, by developing an organism that can, well, if in the case of an animal, um, locate resources and mates, <clears throat> this um, is actually how the function of DNA is carried out, information transfer. Can I ask a clarification? Yeah. Um, if function is uh, what something has put, um, what something does. Metafunction is what? Um, he, well, the function is what something does. A metafunction would be uh, like, a f well, the DNA actually, any ex particular DNA that you might encounter uh, develops an organism, a particular organism with its particular set of traits. And a metafunction is that DN DNA in general, not just any particular DNA, but by this he means that the function of the molecule in general is to make copies of itself. So, um, Shea's position, his description of information transfer in the genetic inheritance system uh, holds with the analogy between communication and uh, genetic inheritance. Uh, namely the point that the DNA means something. It means something about an organism's ancestors. It means something about the lineage and how successful the characters, uh, the, that particular DNA, how successful its historic function was. So he says that there's a real similarity of content between genetic inheritance and uh, linguistic communication. Not the content itself, because your thoughts could be about anything, but uh, linguistic and genetic content are similar types. They're both meaningful. 
This implies that the mind is irrelevant for semantic content. It could exist in a system that's non-mental. And um, for whatever reason we have for thinking language has meaning, we also have for thinking that genes have meaning. And intentionality can be found at the molecular level. So, um, so we set up this picture, if you remember, like at the beginning of my presentation, Uh, where there's a linguistic code, that would be like language, uh, written language, spoken language, com communication, um, and the genetic code, which is the sequence of base pairs in a DNA molecule, and they're produced by systems. The linguistic code is produced by a mind. You have a thought and um, you express it through language. Um, the genetic inheritance system is produced <coughs> by natural selection, which determines uh, which sem semantic tokens, which particular genes are inherited. And um, the receiver system is either a, a person receiving the message or the developmental system receiving the message. And it's carried out in this way. And the messages are sent this way. <coughs> However, so I mean, the idea is that they both have content meaning. Uh, but there is a, a significant dissimilarity. Remember that we're trying to find out something about an unfamiliar system, the genetic system, by analogy with a familiar system, which is the linguistic communication. The significant dissimilarity, well, first I'll introduce ambiguity. Ambiguity is the ability to express more than one meaning. So, uh, for example, say there's a bat in the garage. Okay, well, you might know what I mean uh, from how I say the sentence, but it could mean a couple things. It could mean there's a, a piece of sporting equipment in the garage, and it could also mean that there's a flying mammal in the garage. <coughs> and uh, it's impossible to tell, well, the, the, the meaning of the word bat could have two different senses. Um, in the same way, the genetic system has ambiguity of meaning you know, if they have meaning at all, like Shay says. Uh, because there are so many outcomes to any uh, particular initiation of any particular gene, whether it be the uh, immediate proximal outcomes like amino acids and proteins, or the more distal outcomes such as like morphology and behavior. These are all outcomes of a gene. And uh, they're, and it, and, um, and an outcome of a particular gene could be anything in the causal process from initiation to the development of a, an adult organism. In language, in cases of ambiguous language, uh, misinterpretation between meanings is possible, but there's always a fact about what the speaker meant on a particular occasion. For example, when I say there's a bat in the garage, uh, my thought, what, what I meant by my thought, what I meant by the sentence isn't well, the sentence may be ambiguous, but my thought was not. So there's always a fact about what I meant, and um, my intent determines what the message was meant to be sent. However, in the case of genetic meaning, uh, genetic meaning is determined according to the function in the lineage. In, in cases of ambiguous genes, which is every gene, in principle, nothing could disambiguate the genetic symbols. Nothing could make it true or false that one product was intended rather than another. So since a gene um, doesn't just have one product or one outcome, more accurately, since a gene doesn't just have one outcome, it's impossible to know which outcome was intended since they all reliably correlate with the presence of a gene. And there's no fact in principle as to which outcome was meant by the genetic inheritance system. So uh, why was this gene selected over the alternatives? Because of its historic outcome, but which outcome? And this is how it's different from the linguistic, semantic, linguistic meaning, because there is a fact, and, um, and it is possible to know uh, which sense of a word was meant. So, <clears throat> 
this is how it goes. If the genome is functioning as a code, like, like linguistic code, then something was encoded. Well, what? Information about the success of its historic outcomes. Which outcomes? It's impossible to tell. So there's no fact to determine which message is being sent. So if intentionality, aboutness, fits into the natural world, it's not in the genetic inheritance system. And I guess that's the point. <clears throat> So if all that wasn't perfectly clear to you, <laughs> uh, I invite you to ask some questions. Does anybody care to start? There's a couple of different things I want to ask, but I'll ask one now and come back to it later. Um, surely, one of the fundamental differences between the two systems is the presence of intentionality in the mental systems and the absence of genetic issues put it together. But no doubt, um, um, Nick Lachey, maybe even Nick Lachey as well, are aware of that distinction. That he's no doubt aware that minds have intentionality of a type and that genetics mm -hmm. do not. And so and he's certainly not going to deny that. He's not going to say that genes are thinking and, and mental contents. So how is he going to respond? Throw his hands up and say, geez, I never thought of that. So, is your question, uh, well, you sa you're saying that, of course, uh, a mind is present in the s linguistic? Well, I mean, that was, that's the general, and general understanding. Is he denying you these? Things? No, no, um, of course, there's no mind. Well, I don't think he would say that there's a mind in the genetic inheritance system. Um, but the intentionality uh, that he's drawing attention to is not the. Um, Okay, uh, there, it's the difference between, you know, on the slide I talked about um, as, as if intentionality, um, and this is real <coughs> intentionality. Well, this actually, according to um, John Searle, is divided into two further categories. <clears throat> One he calls intrinsic intentionality, and the other he calls derived intentionality. Intrinsic intentionality has traditionally only been used to uh, talk about minds. And um, it's, it's very certain. It's directed at only, um, only whatever the thought's about. Derived intentionality is relative to whatever, to an inten intrinsically intentional system. Um, and this is actually what uh, Nicholas Shea is talking about. He says that um, the genetic language uh, has derived intentionality according to the metafunction of DNA, which is heritability, just like uh, Linguistic tokens, words, language have derived intentionality according to the meaning uh, or intent of a speaker. Does that answer the so question? So is that how he's going to respond? He's going to say that they have the intentionality of a sort? Yeah, I mean, he says they have content, they have meaning, um, and it's intentionality in that sense. Uh, Nicholas Shea doesn't actually talk about intentionality at all. He doesn't use that word anyway, but he does talk about meaning, content, and um, the implications of his argument are that there is meaning, semantic content in the genetic inheritance system, even though there's not a mind. So, so you're saying that you think you're taking Shea to have the view that uh, that um, genes have derived intentionality. Yes. So, what do you take him to? What, <clears throat> what does he think? I take it on Searle's, correct me if I'm wrong, but on Searle's position, the derived intentionality is derived from some mind. Intrinsically, Intrinsically intentional mind. Yeah. So what's the, what's the, what do you think Shea thinks the analog to mind is? Uh, selection. Yeah, okay, yeah, because uh, I've got it underlined here that we say um, DNA sequences get their meaning from natural selection, capitalized. <laughs> Yeah, I actually so noticed that I had capitalized that and wished that I hadn't right. later. So, yeah, no, but that's appropriate because it's a weird reification, right? <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's odd. Natural selection. It's, does he really think that? I mean, uh, that's a weird well, thing. Well, you're getting at something that's pretty important here. Um, natural selection is pretty weird to talk about as an intrinsically intentional, like, refer reference. or Just like it's weird to talk about a mind because it's like, okay, um, where does this, uh, where do words or some uh, linguistic tokens, where do they get their meaning from? Well, they get it from a mind, just like uh, genetic tokens get it from natural selection, but 
Uh, where does the mind or thoughts get their intentionality from? How can you explain their aboutness? Um, maybe you could ref explain it in terms of uh, brain activity, or um, maybe even regions of the brain. Um, and, and then you're like, well, the region of the brain doesn't really have intrinsic intentionality, and neither does the brain. And you get um, all the way down to a region of the brain, to cells, and um, maybe to molecules. And there's such um, an isomorphism, a part, like a precise analogy between what's happening there and what's happening in communication, that people say, okay, this, this um, in DNA molecules, this is where intentionality is. However, um, y there is a fundamental weirdness talking about the mind as uh, intrinsically intentional, just like it's weird talking about natural selection, like this process as a intrinsically intentional. But in both cases, they would be what the semantic, linguistic, or genetic tokens are referring to and deriving their intentionality from. Is that clear? So is the answer something no. like, well, you no. can't explain it this way? What? Is it something like, well, you, you don't know what the hell mind is, so I don't have to explain it. Yeah, if we accept that, uh, <laughs> well, um, if we accept that a mind as a source of genuine intentionality, if we, if we really accept that, then uh, why not accept natural selection as a source of intrinsic intentionality? But, uh, I mean, it is pretty mysterious where Shea might think that intrinsic intentionality would come from, because natural selection is a process, and what Shea talks about is actually function. He says um, inheritance is the function, and, um, and, and according to this function, genetic tokens have meaning. Just like maybe it's the function of the speech centers of the brain to produce meaningful utterances, I guess is the terminology people talk in. So it's the function of, the, of DNA to produce, or the metafunction of DNA uh, to produce meaningful genetic tokens. It's pretty mysterious. But minds are, are mysteries, too. So do, do, to take an example you won't even mention here, but elsewhere, um, <clears throat> do genes mean, then, the way the clouds mean rain? No. All right. Talk about that. Um, well, uh, clouds aren't intentional semantic tokens. Uh, outside of any meaning that we ascribe to them, you know, like the weatherman's got a little. Um, when, when someone looks at the sky and says, oh, "What does that mean?" That's okay. what we would call um, correlational information. Okay. And, and this is different in what respect? Can you explain a little bit? I mean, how's, how's the gene case sort of an interestingly different case? Correlational information is when two systems um, reliably correlate, like uh, in such a way that um, <clears throat> one is said to carry information about the other. So whenever you see a particular type of cloud in the sky um, to a knowledgeable person, because they see it with such regularity, they're going to say, oh, that means it's going to rain. This is different. Well, I mean, genes have correlational information, too. You know, you see um, oh, every time this gene occurs, this amino acid sequence is produced. Well, that's correlational information. But um, the claim that they have semantic properties goes one step further. It says not only do they have correlational information, because that's everywhere. That's literally everywhere. Like you look at a rock, and you look at how smooth it is, um, and you say, oh, um, this correlates with a certain type of environment, like maybe being uh, tossed around on a beach you know, and, and smoothing out by the water. And, um, and that's correlational information. It's really everywhere. But semantic information is um, real content and meaning and that's um, to say that that's in the in the genome is interesting question because of course genes correlate with their products especially amino acids especially proteins and even more complicated uh, forms phenotypes um, more distant phenotypes um, and that's a stronger claim So yeah, I mean, genes mean their outcomes in the same way that clouds mean rain, uh, but... 
the claim that Shane's view is though that well he would grant that too because yeah. that's not controversial. But he also thinks there's another kind of meaning that points not to the future but to the past. Yes. Right? So I mean genes have this funny way of meaning in two directions. Not that he says that, but you know, sure, that's uh, true. Um, that Especially in reference to the past. When the knowledgeable person uh, you know, observes the gene, they, they, they can point the meaning in two directions. Now, why yes. does he consider that intentional in the way that clouds are not? Um, I, I, I gather both, it's causal in both directions. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, when mm -hmm. calls it from the past, calls it to the future. Uh, the difference in the past is that it's a, the functional role that a gene performed in producing certain adaptive outcomes in the organism's ancestor. That is to say, a uh, gene is meaningful. It means uh, what it was selected for. And it was selected for producing outcomes in its ancestors, in, in its organism's ancestors, that uh, contributed, contributed to its survival and its reproduction. So, um, it's in reference to that function it performed in the lineage that it's considered meaningful. So uh, the gene carries information about not only uh, the outcomes that it may produce, but also about the outcomes that it did produce. And that not only that those were the outcomes, because the outcome may have changed a little bit over time, but that it was um, successful to produce those outcomes historically. And um, I think that may be the key factor is success, you know. Now that is a useful way of thinking about genes, is it not? Shay's way. <coughs> I mean, setting aside whether it's intentional in the same way that words are intentional. Um, or not. A, a useful way. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I, I assume there are people on this earth who do think of genes roughly in that way, right? That they have a, a sort of a causal ancestry and then sort of an interesting story to be told about their past. And they have a functional role in the present, uh, you know, a certain yeah. environment will get, you know, they get expressed. Um, phylogenetics is the study of um, like molecular sequences in DNA, and it's considered to track like um, the, the history of a lineage over time. And everyone, um, you know, when you see these evolutionary trees, those are phylogenetic trees, <coughs> oftentimes. And um, so, if you think about the past, it's all encapsulated in our DNA. So in theory, if um, our DNA is carrying messages, uh, you could decode those messages and learn something about where we came from. And people actually do this, you know? It's how we discover um, the relatedness of organisms. You know, it's like um, how, uh, how similar our genomes are. So it's informative and it's scientific. There's some mutations, I'll use the word mutation, I don't know if that's you know, loud enough, but muta sure. some mutations are good, some mutations are bad. Some of the bad mutations stay with us. Mm -hmm. Are they less meaningful or more meaningful? Well, um, in the sense that uh, a gene tells us about the history of an organism, a mutation is meaningless. You know, according to Shea's take, if he says that um, any particular gene can say something about the ancestral lineage. Of course, a novel mutation, a truly new form, isn't going to tell us anything about history, because it's new. Um, and then what was the second part of your question? Oh, I, I don't know. I guess I was thinking about your, your answer to, you know, making these phylogenies, showing this evolutionary mm -hmm. witness. Of so course. We, we do that through looking at different mutations, right? So mm -hmm. that's what I was getting at. Is are, are some mutations more informative in that, in that way. They're producing better phylogenies maybe than... Yeah, honestly, I don't know too much about phylogenetics, so I can't tell you if they produce better or worse. You sound like you, but some do. resolution, like you get better relatedness, <coughs> or you can understand the relatedness better if you have... This yeah, if there's a mutation you could track. Um, well, a, a mutation wouldn't mean anything, but I'd say the first time that it copies, it gets copied through a reproductive event, um, then it would have some at least a little bit of meaning, because it would say something about your mom or dad, you know? Um, and since that's how genes get their meaning, is through um, inheritance, according to Shea, uh, then it would be meaningful. But prior to that, a completely novel mutation 
is essentially non-semantic. Presumably we have to watch for an ambiguity here too, because the, most of the time you've been talking about whether something has meaning or not, which doesn't come in degrees, either it means or it doesn't mean. But this use of the word meaningful comes in degrees, and that means you know, significance or importance. There's a value judgment okay. there, right? When someone talks about something being more or less meaningful, nothing in your, in your talk or paper involves degrees of meaning. No, I'm not touching that. Okay. Uh, yeah, because because honestly, I just don't know too much about phylogenetics and um, whether a mutation would be, <clears throat> I don't know, more useful or less useful about evolutionary history. Yes, Dr. Miller. So, one of Richard Dawkins' books, or a couple of them, he, he talks about the selfish gene. Yeah. He describes it in different ways. Sometimes he describes it as this specifically better, truer picture of biological reality than other times. And in other places, he says it's sort of like the neck of the cube. It's just another way of looking at the same thing. It's not really better. It's just another way of perceiving things. What turns on this distinction that Shea is making? Does it make any difference? Is, is it just another way of looking at things? Or is, there, is this somehow true? Or you know, would it be wrong not to see it this way? Well, well, why does this matter? Is it's it just a linguistic dispute about how we use the word meaningful? Um, the question, my question, is um, oof, where does meaning fit into the natural world? Right, because we're sure minds have it. We're pretty sure. A lot of people, it's fairly uncontroversial <laughs> in some circles that minds have meaning. Um, and And... So is it crazy to think that genes might too? Um, so the, the implications that this have, that this discussion has, is where does uh, meaning, and not just meaning, but intentionality, aboutness, fit into the natural world? Because of course, if our minds have it, if we grant that, um, might other systems, especially other systems that do a lot of same things that a mind does, it communicates information. So uh, if you're interested in where meaning and uh, intentionality enters the natural world, um, then, yeah, something turns on this. Because it eliminates a possibility. It eliminates the possibility that it comes in at the molecular level. But it also depends on what you mean by meaning and intentionality, right? When we can define, as Bo was saying, you could say that the clouds are meaningful, or the tree rings are meaningful, mm -hmm. or the, the, the layers of strata in a ge geological sort of position are meaningful because they tell you about the rivers and stuff that flow through there. But that's not the kind of meaning we're talking about when we talk about the meaning of, of semantics in a mind. So yeah, those have a kind of meaning, they're similar, but they're not the same thing we mean when we say the words mean something to me. Are they? I mean, we seem to be using the words differently and saying, well, I can say that those things have meaning and the words have meaning, so therefore meaning is everywhere. Yeah, that's the, the same type of correlational information we were talking about um, when two systems reliably correlate in such a way that you can say um, one's informative about another. However, um, meaning uh, is well. Okay, you could just you could um, define intentionality as the property of a mind. That's not, um, and actually, so some people do. They say it only belongs to minds. And if I said that, then this uh, discussion would not be interesting at all. Because, of course, intentionality is not in the genome. Only minds have it. So you can use it any way you want. But this um, topic is uh, narrowing down where intentionality fits into the real world. And um, we're saying, well, my argument is that it's not at the molecular level. So if we eliminate that possibility, um, then there's one, <laughs> one fewer possibilities about where meaning could fit in the natural world. And um, as to your point about uh, whether those um, tree rings mean the uh, tree is a certain number of years old, according to the wet, dry seasons, as indicated, the thickness of the rings. Um, that means something to us. You know, uh, those are not semantic in and of themselves, but uh, we could um, interpret them as representations of something that happened uh, historically. Um, this is different than what's happening in Shea's account of like a historical uh, 
history carry, uh, meaning about history in the genome, because uh, although the tree rings carry information about the history of the tree, and the genome carries uh, information about the history of the organism, um, he said what it turns on it is that the um, inheritance is the natural function or the meta function of DNA. Uh, so, by uh, inheriting certain types, genotypes, uh, and reproducing them, um, DNA is doing what it's supposed to do. And, um, and this is, uh, means that some genotypes or phenotypes are more successful than others. And um, it attributes real meaning <coughs> to what's happening in the genome versus what's happening uh, in the tree rings. But I don't think they're I don't think it's meaningful in the same way as what's happening in our thoughts or in um, linguistics, you know. But uh, shades of count is different uh, than what's happening in tree rings. Yeah. Well, I guess I would say it's, it's, you, you say it's different, and he says it's different, but I don't see how it's different. Mm. That, yeah, that, he that, that was the point that Doug was making earlier. It's not mm. clear how it's really different. I mean, they're obviously different things. <laughs> he's attributing the difference to what he calls the meta function of. DNA in general. So yes. it, it appears that, <clears throat> at least it appears to me on the reading this, that you see a connection between functionalist accounts of the mind and Shay's view about Shay's view here about <clears throat> genes. Um, and in fact, you developed. You haven't gone into this in much detail, but you started talking about functions. So yeah. About sure. Um, about the last at least the last third of the paper, I take you to be making the following argument. Um, if biological and mental intentionality are the same, then functionalism would have to be correct. Um, because biological intentionality does work the way that functionalists say that mental intentionality does. Um, then functionalism is not correct for the standard reason. Mm -hmm. the um, therefore, biological Mm -hmm. Is that an accurate way to describe it? Yes, the that's accurate to script control. Okay, good, good. I understand you. Um, what seems to be missing here, um, to me though, is the is uh, you seem to be assuming something like, or I take it that you're I, I take it that you're assuming something like, if functionalism is correct, then biological and mental intentionality are the same. Is the, the converse? Of that yeah, you know, there's um, something. But I don't see <laughs> Yeah, there's something, um, to be honest, uh, in, in this presentation that's not so explicit in my paper, right? And then that has to do with ambiguity. Or I just want to make sure that we're on the same page. Um, you said that if uh, mental intentionality or if mental functionalism is correct, then biological functionalism. Uh, well, yeah, functionalism is correct. I, I gather that you're assuming that if functionalism is correct, it's correct to count of mind, then it must be the case that genes have intentionality just as much as mm, That's interesting. Uh, I mean, the, the thing that I didn't mention in the paper explicitly, as I did here, is um, ambiguity. Mm -hmm. So, um, if functionalism, I, I do see that's an implication. If functionalism, I don't know how to answer your question. It's a very open-ended question. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe asking for things like I do see that. That's interesting. I mean, I guess, I, mean, I, I, I think I understand your argument of the last third, and, and I think that it does seem it does seem right, but it, it isn't clear to me that. I mean, it, it isn't clear to me that even with a functionalist view of the mind, you would need to accept anything like the claim that genes genes convey. Yeah, I mean, I guess not, especially um, since I do point out some differences in the analogy that I think ma make a difference. Um, Namely, the points about ambiguity in um, language versus ambiguity in the genome. So I guess it wouldn't imply that. 
Well, I think, I mean, I think it's an interesting question because I think if you had, if you had a, an argument that functionalism, that if functionalism is correct, then biological and mental intentionality are the same, you have, a, you have an answer to Carl's question, right? You have an answer to why it's interesting. But I don't, I don't see that. Right yeah. well, what about this, you know, you made a lot early on about the isomorphism between the, the, the analogy, I mean, but it's, I remember the paper there was stuff about isomorphism. It's not just well they kind of look alike in some respects. There's all oh, the parallels, mm -hmm. the linguistic utterances and genetic um, utterances, mm -hmm. <laughs> genetic transmission. Right? And the thought is that, well, if a functionalist account will work for the one, we explain why one is intentional. Why wouldn't it work for the same young thing? I mean, this might be a direction to go to look for an answer. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea is that. In any analogy, there, um, well, analogies are really common in science. Mm -hmm. uh, compare an unfamiliar system with something that you know a lot about and, and hopefully learn something from it. Uh, and there's two possibilities here. Either that the um, analogy is a metaphor, that the systems are a lot alike, and, um, but, and then the other possibility is that they're exactly isomorphic, which just means that all the components of one system directly map onto the components of another system. So the idea, um, oh, what example did I give in the paper about a, uh, yeah, that's the isomorphic. What's, um, a metaphor would just be something, oh, like, the, um, say, an engineer builds a pump and says, oh, this is a lot like what the heart does, though so the heart's a pump, you know? And that's um, a qualitative similarity to base an analogy on. However, um, John Maynard Smith believes there is an exact isomorphism that all the parts of uh, one system directly map onto another system. And he um, gives an example of a time when he worked as an aircraft engineer. And he was, uh, oh, determining some part of the plane. But to figure out how they should build the large structure, they built a tiny model of it. And this is an exact isomorphism because the equations they used uh, to determine the structure of the small model were the exact same equations they used for the actual plane. So um, a qualitative analogy may be useful, but an exact isomorphism is really good. You know, um, that means your analogy is pretty perfect. And um, it seems as though in the communication of information analogy, um, the isomorphism is pretty precise. You know, um, we have uh, language made of symbols. Um, those symbols are given content <coughs> by natural selection or by a mind. And that there is a receiver system uh, interpreting the messages. You know, and I guess uh, the interpretation in either case is sometimes ambiguous. Um, development you know, acts according to the instructions that are encoded in the DNA code. Um, a receiver interprets the message according to the words in whatever language you're speaking. And that's how it works. But in the receiver response, you don't have receiver understanding. It's almost like a behavioristic habit. Mm -hmm. So I would say that that's not, you're leaving something out. Maybe yeah. Communication implies somebody on the other end who understands, not just mm -hmm. what you respond to the right way. Right. You show up at the door, the door of the professor's office two days later, but you understood the meaning of the message, mm -hmm. and that's not part of the equation. And there's no analog at the bottom of that, is there? Well, uh, I mean, I do, I, you'd think it'd be like, um, th this is actually what's happening in development. Uh, enzymes recognizing amino acids, uh, particularly like something like this. You know, that's why it's so easy to talk about this. You could say, I recognized the message. Um, the task was... <laughs> To, to read the words and decipher what they meant, to discriminate between their meanings, um, you know, yada yada. You could say all these things of me, and um, that's part of the analogy too. I know I did say receiver response, um, but assuming they're uh, both English speakers, uh, there's sort of an agreed upon meaning for all the words, and if you know what the words mean, um, you're going to understand them. Just like if, if the developmental system knows, um, well. The developmental system. See, for any any procedure that happens in development, that could be spoken of in intentional vocabulary, there's a a set of more complex 
more complex physical processes that could be substituted. So if you say um, the enzyme recognized the, you know, the, this molecule, well, you could say, um, you know, it fit in just so perfectly, and then it cat catalyzed the reaction, and yada yada. You could substitute it with the physical process, and that would be the analog to understanding. Did you have something? Well. Are you done with that last mm -hmm. one? <laughs> this is not really a question. Maybe there's a question in here. I don't know. I just wanted to float an idea by you. Uh, I remember when I was introduced to intentionality as a philosophy, philosophy topic, and one of the some must have been a teacher told me now don't you be careful about this because there's an ambiguity here. There's two different meanings of intentional. There's intentional that means like voluntary, right? You know that you're doing it on purpose. I kind of. And then there's this intention, this aboutness. Don't get them confused, they said. And, well, I, I find that, that, that uh, the intentional in, the, in, the, in your sense, this, this linguistic sense, when separated from the, at least too far from the other one, um, seems to run people into trouble. Or at any rate, uh, they, they lose track of something. I, mean, I just want to float an idea. This is half-baked, I realize, but I just wanted to... It, it seems to me that when someone does something intentionally, they're doing it voluntarily. Right? I mean, in that in the other sense. And to do something voluntarily, you do it because you want to do it, that you care about it. There's an element of caring involved, right? Well, it seems to me that when someone is 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 using their mind in this about sense, so the interesting sense of about, it, the truth is that they're caring about something. And that, that, that's the interesting thing about what minds do. Um, and, and, I mean, are words about things? Well, only if somebody cares about it. Only if someone uh, is, is up to something. They're, they're interpreting something. They're trying to communicate. They're, they're, they're caring. In other words, I, I, I don't think, I think that, that the, the, the interesting sen sense of, the, of aboutness, the, the relevant sense, the important sense, it actually is very closely related to the, intent, the other sort of intention. That it, it, it has something to do with uh, you know, valuing, in a way, at, at some level. And, and of course, that's what's utterly absent, or one of the things that's utterly absent in the, uh, well, the, you know, the gene case. Nobody's caring about anything. It's just, it's, it's, yeah, no one's caring about anything, but they are up to something. Huh? Like the, gene, the gene is up to something. Oh, yeah, there, there, there's a significant causal interpretation that you can give of the, of the, of the, of the situation. But, um, Do biologists need this? I, I, I'm particularly addressing the biologist, the one right to my left. Uh, I mean, do, do you need this talk, this about this talk? Is it just too darn confusing? It talk? is confusing. Yeah. You can't. No, no. Can you can you can you not talk genetics uh, without ev evoking uh, well up to something? Uh, you know, as if there's agendas. No, I mean, you know, it's random. Biology is random. Man. It has been suggested that um, uh, eliminating the use of intentional vocabulary from biology would make it incomprehensible. If for every intentional word you substituted <coughs> the actual causal physical process that's occurring, like the recognition of amino acid sequence, for example, um, it would become so cumbersome that it'd be really hard to follow what's going on. And I mean, of course, you do see it um, in technical papers, but it'd be, you couldn't do it in an entry-level classroom. I mean, you, uh, just like you couldn't do it in a chemistry classroom. I remember, uh, I don't know, maybe freshman in high school physics, my teacher was saying, oh, the valence electron wants once a full valence ring, you know, once it. What do you mean, once it? You know, <laughs> like. But and and it was really hard for her to tell me what what she really meant. You know, it's like it's um, seeking a stable state. But even then, you're saying it's seeking a state, and it's like, well, does it have preferences? Um, is it making choices? And uh, so, although most people realize that we're using these terms in the as if sense, it seems like. They're doing intentional things, and that kind of goes without saying. To actually eliminate it 
from our scientific vocabulary might be counterproductive. But it is useful too. I mean, we want to predict things in science, and you know, we predict things because we know it's going to happen. We know the transcript is going to go to the right. We know it's going to go to the right. It wants to. It leads the nucleus to go to the right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's definitely an uh, economy of expression. It seems like the danger is when we use these expressions that we somehow start reading them. Right? We, exactly. We forget that they're just metaphors. Or like they're just easy ways of talking. They're not really seeking. They're not really lofty. They're not really desired. So it seems like that's sort of what's happening here with the Che, is that he's sort of forgotten that they're just... Yeah, well, he's kind of... He's trying to come up with... Um, He's not saying that they're intentional. Like I said, I think that's an implication of his argument. Um, however, he is saying that they're meaningful, you know, which um, is a sense of intentionality, and it sort of implies, if it's meaningful, then it implies a meaner. And who's meaning it? Well, not a mind, so what's meaning it? It gets a little hairy. I'm sorry, you said you didn't say intentional. Mm -mm. Say semantic, yes, he does. Say semantic, <coughs> yes, yes. He's not talking about intentionality he use explicitly. The word, yes. <coughs> well, is anyone else curious about anything? Shelby? You said that uh, in linguistics, the message behind. Um, that sentence isn't ambiguous, but the sentence itself may be ambiguous, but that uh, genetics don't have something similar. But say when a cell tries to copy all of its genetic information, then each time it's trying to, it's trying to make an exact copy, but there's some sort of mistake. So in that sense, isn't it unambiguous? In what it's trying to do, and the actual ambiguous part is what it produced. Uh, yeah, maybe. You know, um, are you saying that uh, its function is unambiguous? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, just She's like. <laughs> What's that? She's just hoping that he's just hoping that Shay fell around. Oh, just I know. Yeah, he's encouraging the analogy here. Um, yeah, just like, um, you know, if, if these um, intermediates, the codes, are actually deriving their meaning from the producer systems, um, if you're focusing on the producer systems as the intentional element, uh, and Shay does say that the function is inheritance itself, you know, to make copies. So I think that you're on to something. And it is the products that are, unamb are that are um, ambiguous. It was the products I was comparing. Like words can could be ambiguous, um, just like gene genetic outcomes could be ambiguous. Have you ever heard someone try to like work an argument for the existence of God out of this kind of a thing? You know, where, where, where they'll say, "Well, look, you can't you can't make sense of biology without intentionality, and you can't have intentionality without mind." So. If biology evidently makes sense, therefore there's got to be a mind. What mind? It must be God. Like yeah, I haven't heard it yet, but I thought about it. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. What do you think of that as an argument? Uh, about half-baked and very short. Mm. Uh, about a serious topic. Say there's got to be a mind. Well, I mean, it's just, a, I, I mean, I guess it's just a regress, I think. Like, um, you know, like uh, linguistic code gets its meaning from our minds? Where does uh, the natural world get meaning? Well, from a creator's mind. Sure, you could say that, but then where the, you know, and, and actually, the, the, actually, the interesting relationship here is that um, this semantic system, intentional system, is created by this one. You know, um, so uh, you try to explain what's happening here in terms of this, maybe. And then you got to try to explain this in terms of something else. You know, so it might be God, 
or it might be um, physical and chemical laws. But um, no matter what, uh, there's no really clear stopping point. Uh, people, tr people try to stop here um, at the macromolecules because that seems to be the um, sort of fundamental to life. Everything that, that's alive has it. You know, but even that's kind of unclear because when you look at something like a virus. It's almost an argument for panpsychism. Right? That the need minds at the upper level, so we can't explain how it gets it there, so there must be minds at the lower level. So everything must have minds. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Something like that. 